Let me introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Frederick Fritz Hanselman. Fritz is his, well, it's the name you've grown up with, yeah. right? the name I've always known him as. Uh, he is currently research faculty at Texas State University. Um, he's also the chief underwater archaeologist and dive, diving program director with the Meadows Center for Water and Environment there also at Texas State University. Um, previously, he's been employed by uh, the Institute of Nautical Archaeology as a field archaeologist and diving safety program, or, I'm sorry, uh, diving safety officer. Um, and he has also been employed by Indiana University as a field research director and lecturer for the Office of Underwater Science. Um, currently, he's working on, uh, well, more, more projects than I can count, but uh, right now he's the principal investigator for the Rio Chagres Maritime Landscape Study. Uh, which continues to search for the lost ships of Henry Morgan. That's their current project right now. Uh, and he'll be speaking a little bit about that tonight. Um, he is also the principal investigator for the Monterey Shipwreck Project in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which is the deepest shipwreck excavation ever conducted in North America. Also part of the presentation tonight. Um, he's also the principal investigator for the Spring, Spring Lake Underwater Archaeology Project, which is an on-campus dive site there at uh, Texas State University uh, in uh, San Marcos, Texas. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty phenomenal. They have at that site an ar archeological um, components within that lake. And so he uh, is conducting not only ongoing research there, but uh, trains all your students. You train all your students mm -hmm. in, the, in the spring itself. So. Also the co-director of the Sunken Ships of Columbia Project, which focuses on finding, documenting, studying, and managing historic shipwrecks along the Caribbean coast of Columbia. Uh, and finally, he's also uh, the assistant director of the Captain Kidd Shipwreck Project, which was a, a, a pirate um, shipwreck off the uh, coast of the Dominican Republic. Um, Professor Hanselman also focuses on capacity building and training for archaeologists and heritage managers in less developed countries, as well as the development of ma uh, marine protected areas and underwater preserves, and this is throughout Latin America. He's also a GUE cave and technical diver, a nautical archaeology society tutor, uh, a certified scuba instructor, an ambassador for aqua dive watches, a member of the body <laughs> glove diving what? team. I could go on and on, right? And a fellow of the Explorers Club. Uh, he's been widely featured in global and print uh, electronic media. If any of you guys Googled his name at any point, which I encourage you to do, you'll find numerous videos from numerous venues, uh, including documentaries with the National Geographic and Sundance Channel. Uh, documented, it was uh, 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 basically documented the uh, ongoing project of the Lost Ships of Henry Morgan. Uh, it was premiered here at uh, Sundance Film Festival this uh, winter. Um, and uh, you can catch him even on a an episode, or actually three episodes of Jimmy Kimmel Live, in which his project was featured, uh, and Jimmy Kimmel's sidekick, Guillermo, went down and got a couple dive lessons from uh, Professor Hanselman down there. Uh, and finally, he regularly, regularly gives public lectures and presentations from museums, universities, other organizations. Uh, he is a, a National Geographic grantee, and so he maintains a blog on the National <coughs> Geographic Explorers Journal, so you guys can always check that out. So with no further ado, we would like to turn the time over, oh, and... Professor Hawkins, yes. Our he fail, was an fail undergraduate in our department, sitting in the same chairs and courses all of you Absolutely. are in, and was in my Guatemalan field school in 2003. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Dr. Hawkins should take all the credit. <laughs> yeah. no, and I, I should mention that I met Fritz um, on this, this uh, field project that he was on. I was conducting different research in Guatemala at the time. Uh, it's been 10 years now, we've been friends ever since, and, uh, and so uh, it's, it's my privilege to introduce you uh, to, uh, or introduce Fritz Handelman for, as our speaker uh, tonight, so Fritz Handelman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After an introduction like that, I'm not really sure what I should say to you now. <laughs> I do have to say that it's, it's an honor, it's a privilege, and I'm humbled to be back where I first started uh, getting into the field of anthropology and, and what has turned into a career that I, that I love and things that I'm fascinated with. Um, it's almost full circle. I started here and now I'm here presenting professionally in the same room with many of the professors that mentored me, that I learned from, that I, that I grew from, and, uh, and uh, I hope that this is fun, enlightening, and, and uh, we'll regale you with stories of, of the deep and shipwrecks, and, and I hope you take something away from this that the anthropology is, is not only interesting, but it's exciting. Um, 
So without further ado, I'd like to get, I'd like to get started. And one of the things I, I think about in terms of archaeology is a lot of us think about terrestrial archaeology, which I highly enjoy. But when you think about the world itself, the majority of our planet is covered with water. And water has been a resource that sustains us. It helps us grow our crops. It keeps us thriving and alive and surviving as a society. And for thousands of years, it also served as the medium for transportation. So I'm going to talk to you about some prehistoric archaeological work that I'm involved with. And then I'm also going to talk to you about some shipwrecks and some shipwreck projects. So I'm going to dabble in the prehistoric archaeological world as well as the more historic archaeological world. And uh, hopefully that this will be, uh, I hope that this will be enjoyable at least. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start thinking about what we have on campus. I'm going to try in the next 40, 45 minutes to cram in 13,000 years of history within, oh, probably four projects. Okay, what's really special about Texas State is we have a lake on campus called Spring Lake. It consists of 200 different springs uh, that are artesian springs, they're gravity fed, and this lake uh, houses a number of prehistoric material culture. Uh, from the ancient inhabitants of North America and the Paleo Indians all the way up through Native Americans to the historic activity in the area from Spanish colonization to Anglo colonization uh, and settlement, Spring Lake has seen a vast array of, of history in the San Marcos area. And we can even look at how the resource was used in a more modern era when it was created to be, uh, it was used as the first, it was the site of the first amusement park in the state of Texas called Ocarina Springs, replete with mermaids, swimming pigs, and underwater shows, and an underwater theater even. That amusement park has since uh, been closed, and it's now an environmental education center where we teach people about aquatic resources and what are housed within the waters of Spring Lake both biological and cultural. Archaeology, uh, archaeological efforts first began in Spring Lake in the late 1970s with uh, Professor Joel Shiner from Southern Methodist University uh, who thought that this would be an interesting place to see what people were doing as far as water usage uh, in, in prehistoric times in Texas. And what they did was over a number of field seasons, uh, probably through about seven years, they excavated thousands of artifacts, including a handful of Clovis points, which were found out of context. But what they found was each period of prehistory of Texas was represented in the archaeological record, which was very interesting. Fast forward to 2010, and not very little had been done since Shiner's work, uh, and the park was undergoing a major transition. It was changing from being in what was the, a derelict amusement park into what we have today is the Environmental Education Center. So they were removing the submersible theater, they were taking down all the buildings and the infrastructure that had existed on the peninsula inside the lake, uh, and they had asked me to come in and help them uh, complete some of the Section 106 or the regulatory archaeology prior to the removal of the submersible. And so uh, uh, what we did first off was we dug a test pit in the, in the lake in front of the submersible. And it was pretty interesting because I'm largely a historical archeologist and so I work with shipwrecks. And most of the time we don't have much stratigraphy on some of these shipwrecks. So as we, we dug into this test pit, we were able to, to see even underwater the different stratigraphic layers. And in the very bottom of this, this uh, pit in kind of this organic gray uh, layer, we actually had a wood sample that dated to 13,300 to 13,600 BP. Uh, so it's interesting that the preservation of the, the wood was uh, enough that we could get a date from it even underwater. And so that's, that's one of the things that kind of was really special. Another thing that's special about this place is just the visibility. You're in central Texas with visibility of the Caribbean. And all throughout the lake, and you can see here where the water actually bubbles up through the bed of the lake, uh, we find lithic fragments. A lot of them are out of context, but we have bifaces, preforms, scrapers, blade cores, and even um, some more identifi uh, identifiable points, such as this Pedernales point here. Um, in addition, uh, Mother Nature has actually helped us do some of our work in which we haven't had to excavate. Due to some heavy rains, a big chunk of one portion of uh, the outside the peninsula was eaten away, and it exposed some wood, which allowed us to get some dates 
within stratigraphic context, and we've had some difficulty with the photo mosaic, but uh, it is what it is. And interestingly enough, you can see as you look down the dates at the very bottom of this profile, we found in context a Guadalupe bif uh, biface that was around until the early archaic, uh, lasting until about 5500 BP. Okay, now what's really interesting about what happened when Dr. Shiner was working in the springs was that they had the amusement park and it was up and running and it was thriving. So when he approached them with the idea of conducting archaeological research in the springs, they said, okay, well, we have these glass bottom boat tours. So we don't want you to mess up the visibility by kicking up a bunch of sediment while the tours are going. And he says, well, okay, I'll, I'll go down here downstream. And they said, well, you know, don't go too far because if you find something cool, we'd like to drive the boats over you so people can watch. So, you know, that was one of the things when I first started there, I thought, well, you know, they've done all this work. They've got this phenomenal collection of artifacts. What else is there to be done? And when, that, when an old timer told me that story, I said, oh, this is pretty interesting. So what we decided to do was start fresh. And we began a, a geoarchaeological survey using a depth or a, a, a sub-bottom profiler, excuse me. And, and we kind of hooked up our work barge to become what we called our party barge, which essentially <laughs> had all our, nav, all our navigational equipment and our DGPS and everything hooked up so that we could actually map the lake bed and, and try to read into the sediment of the lake bed and see if we could find anything like this buried sediment lens that might be indicative of anything that would have been uh, material culture or archaeological in nature. Now the difficulty we had with this was the lake is fairly shallow and it, and it rises and sinks according to the springs. So uh, we did have some areas where you can see it says acoustic voids because it was too shallow to actually get a good reading uh, with the profiler. The next phase of the, of the survey was to actually take a series of cores and we tested a number of systems, uh, but what we found was the, the, the bottom, the lake bed, excuse me, was very, was very thick and our initial efforts weren't extremely successful using uh, our, first, our first MacGyvered coring device. So what we did was we just went bigger and better, right? That's what Texas is all about. <laughs> so we got a 55 pound fence post driver, we hooked it up to a regulator and we powered it with scuba tanks, okay, compressed air. And since we're in, a, one, it's a state archeological landmark, and two, there are eight endangered species that, are, that live and make their habitat here in the springs. So we had to ensure that we were compliant with all of the, uh, the environmental rules and regulations that, that exist as well. So in order to uh, lubricate this, this coring device, we used vegetable oil instead of normal oil. So it was completely environmentally friendly and no fish or endangered species were harmed. But you can see here, it functions kind of like a jackhammer underwater. And what we did was we were able to successfully extract a number of core samples, which are currently undergoing analysis, and we're studying the sediments. And if you look at the pictures in higher resolution, you can actually get a snapshot of what's going on in the depositional history of, of the lake bed. Uh, and luckily, I have some wonderful colleagues at Texas State, uh, like Dr. Michael Collins, Dr. John Lose, um, who have worked with us to do some of the analysis and look at modeling the stratigraphy of the lake bed and the, and the surrounding area, which gives us a better idea of really what we're dealing with and what the extent of the resource is. And so that's what we've started there. And the really one of the neatest things for me about Spring Lake is the fact that on one given day, you can find an Ice Age horse tooth just diving. And it also presents a phenomenal opportunity for our students to learn scientific diving and underwater archaeology firsthand in a true archaeological site. We do not dive in the pool. We do a swim test in the pool and then our students practice and learn the methods over the course of a semester, logging a minimum of two dives every week. So that's what makes this site for me very, very unique and very special. Um, and so we have this fascinating site that's underwater in Texas and, and we're learning even more about it and about uh, Texas prehistory as we progress with this project. Uh, another project that I assist with uh, that I'm not principal investigator or director, even though Mike announced like five projects that I, I do, um, is the Quintana Roo Cave Archaeology Project. And this is a project that's very interesting. For over 20 years, cave divers have been exploring the sunken caves and caverns of the Yucatan Peninsula. And what they've done, in addition to mapping the caves and just exploring and seeing what's new and what they can find, is they've actually located a number of archaeological sites. 
So the area that we're working in, in the Yucatan Peninsula, is right here just south of Tulum by this Yancan Biosphere Reserve. Now, what's interesting with these caves in Mexico is that they were once dry caves. And that's what you're going to ask when you see some of these pictures, is how did all that get back in there? And when you see some of the pictures, you'll say, that's underwater? That was my gut reaction when I saw uh, images of these years ago when I first started diving. And basically what happened was at the end of the last glacial maximum, sea level rose, pushing the fresh water and the water table up into what were at one time terrestrial caves. So you have the same formations. You have the speleothems, the stalactites, the stalagmites, um, and it's as if it were a land cave, but we dive there. And you can see we can track these uh, cenotes lately by using GIS and trying to tie them in uh, geospatially. And so what we'll do to find new cenotes is find them remote, via remote sensing and then hike out into the jungle and see if there's passage and then we'll try to dive that passage and connect that to other sites. Um, and my colleague Sam Meacham, who is a research scientist, is one of the principal explorers on this project. Uh, and uh, we're getting ready to launch some other things. And so in these caves, we found evidence of human, human activity from the Paleo-Indians all the way up to the classic Mayan. I know these are kind of kitschy photos, so I'll just apologize to my, my professors. Um, but you can see we have phenomenally preserved Maya ceramics and, and bones and, and mortuary, uh, mortuary vases to uh, skeletal remains found in uh, Najaron Cenote and, and Las Palmas in the, in the Maya Blue Cenote. And so we're finding very interesting osteological remains that allow us to have more of an idea of what was, what was going on and perhaps even the usage of these caves. Another one is in uh, Cenote El Templo. And so you can see we have a mixture of male and female and it's just, it, the preservation is very phenomenal. Excuse me. In underwater sites, the water typically creates well, a semi-anoxic environment. So it l inhibits the oxygen that can cause decomposition. And that's why in some shipwreck sites, you'll even have the entire hull that would be there. Uh, and in a lot of these exp exploration dives, we find and we run across all sorts of things from alligator, alligator remains to gomphotheres and extinct megafauna from the Pleistocene. In one such system in the Sistema Actunhu, we have a site that's called Oyo Negro, and this is one that has been very, very highly documented as of late. Uh, our friends Beto Nava, Alejandro, and Franco were exploring this cave system, and they got about 1.5 kilometers back into the cave. And you can see what I mean. If you remove the divers from there, it looks like a terrestrial cave. And they were 1.5 kilometers back in this cave when they came across a black pit, hence the name Oyo Negro. When they returned to get to the bottom of it, because they hit about 80 feet deep, and they, they decided we can't go deeper than this, we don't have the right mix, the gas mixture to breathe, etc. They found a number of things, and what they've been talking about is this being sort of the La Brea tar pits of uh, this cave system. They have found a, a wide variety of, again, Pleistocene megafauna, smilodonts, saber-toothed cats, gomphotheres, extinct sloths, and also human remains. You can see from the, the cranium here to the right in that picture. Working with Jim Chatters and the National Geographic Society, uh, they've been documenting this and trying to get a better understanding of what was really going on in that area. Surrounding the area, some other features that are very interesting, such as what could be fire pits. We have carbon, we have what could be charcoal there. We're not sure, but we're documenting this and we're trying to get a sense of really what's going on in this, in this site. And something else that we've looked at are these strange markings at the edge of the, of the precipice before you go into the black pit or the Hoyo Negro. And we have hypothesized, it's, maybe it's a, a pipe dream, but it could possibly be that these are rope marks that people used to rappel down into the pit. If there was water, they would go after the water. And that campfire, what could be the, the possible campfire, is on a ledge about 60 feet down from the precipice. And here's a, a, a look at the these markings vertically. So there's a lot going on in these, in, these, uh, in these caves 
and we're trying to figure out what the context is and how to map these. That's one of the difficulties of what we do, is it's, it's, it's hard to map this pit due to the nature of the collapse and all the rocks and the varying depths. So we have created two-dimensional maps where we can look at where all the features of the site are in correlation with one another, and uh, we're actually working on creating a photo mosaic. Uh, in addition, we're going to go underwater and we're going to actually do a 3D laser scan of, uh, of, the, of the cranium. Uh, actually, that was done this past summer. And, uh, and Jim Chatters is currently doing the analysis on this. So we believe this is a, a female between the ages of 18 to 20. And we're not sure how she got there or why she's there. And that begs the question of what else is out there. And so we're, we're at the cusp of exploring really what's going on in these caves and what people were using them for. And, uh, and, and really, it's, it's something that's just spectacular. So those are a couple of the prehistoric projects I'm involved with. And it's, 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 I'd like to segue into some more of the historical uh, archaeology. Because as water was a resource for the people that, that needed it for their agriculture, um, for drinking, etc., I also mentioned that water is also the medium through which thousands of years our ancestors traveled. Okay? Ships were like the 747 of their day, and Mother Nature was not always kind to the ships that plied her waters. And so for thousands of years, from Native American, uh, Native American watercraft to modern shipwrecks, yes, that is the Titanic in the upper right-hand corner, uh, we have an, an amazing museum under the sea. And that's the way we like to think about these shipwrecks. And part of looking at a shipwreck is one not only looking at it as a time capsule that gives us a snapshot of exactly what was going on in that time period, what people were eating, what people were wearing, the division of labor on a ship, etc. But it also allows us to tie in that one site to a larger network and on a more global scale. So what I'd like to do is fast forward to colonial Spain. We're moving out of the prehistoric uh, Texas and Mexico, prehistoric Western Hemisphere into colonial Spain. Spanish conquest and colonization occurred for more than 200 years. And by the late 16th century, the Spanish colonies uh, in America extended from California to Buenos Aires in modern day Argentina. Uh, and in admiration of this achievement, even Sir Walter Raleigh listed all the adversities that the Spanish had overcome to establish their, their, their control of the New World. He listed tempests and shipwrecks, famine, overthrows, mutinies, heat and cold, pestilence, and all manner of diseases, both old and new, together with extreme poverty and want of all things needful. So even Spain's greatest rival at the time begrudgingly respected them for what they were able to do, although we know that the conquest and colonization devastated the native inhabitants of, of these lands. But it's just interesting to look at the scale of, 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 these, of these societies and or of the colonies. And of course, we all know what became the main driving factor behind these colonies was the use or the, the, the extraction of gold and silver and, and the natural resources and how they actually used the natives to, uh, to further that. And that's really what a lot of people think of when they think of underwater archaeology. They think of treasure. And really for us, treasure, the treasure is the history. The treasure is the artifact. The treasure is the information that we get from these sites that allow us a glimpse into what life was like three, four, five hundred, even ten thousand years ago. Okay, and so, but this is interesting because this is what the Spanish were after as well. And so they would take the gold and silver and the natural resources, they would load them on their galleons that sailed regularly from the New World, from ports such as Cartagena in Colombia, Havana in Veracruz, uh, Campeche, and also Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. And they would sail back for Spain, uh, laden with natural resources, gold and silver, etc. Now it goes without saying that Spain needed to fortify their colonies to protect the gold and silver. Okay? And and, uh, and they did so, and they, con they carried out massive construction projects to be able to protect these colonies, to protect the, more than, the, more than the colonies, to protect the actual flow of the gold and silver. So, 
by the late 16th century, the red colonies, or the, the red here in the Western Hemisphere is what Spain controlled. Okay, and one of the things that we're looking at is getting an idea of how the ports existed and what's going on. One of the things that's really interesting is the project that we just started. We developed it for three years and we just had our first field season this summer, a short three week field season in the Sunken Ships of Columbia project. And there are two areas that we're looking at uh, along the Caribbean coast of, of Colombia. The first is Valle de Gloria. Valle de Gloria is the bay right off of um, one of the, well actually the very first successful uh, Spanish settlement on Tierra Firme or the mainland, Santa Maria la Antigua de Darien. Uh, founded in 1509, which was eventually taken over and governed by um, Balboa, for those of you who know your conquistadores. And one of the things that we did was we surveyed the bay and interestingly enough we found uh, this rock wall and we're curious to know whether that was possibly a breakwater or if that had been put there and we've looked at the old, we've looked at the old charts and we're trying to figure out if this is all deposition. Uh, and so a lot of what you're seeing with Columbia is we've done the survey and we're doing a lot of archival research to see if what we find in the archives gels with what we're seeing in the water and on, and, and on the sites. Okay, so we found this, this, uh, this elongated sort of rock wall, and it's the only thing that has rocks like that in the area. And we also conducted a magnetometer survey. Now basically a magnetometer is an apparatus that we tow behind the ship, which again is similar to a sub-bottom profiler, but it's like a large-scale metal detector. So it reads um, magnetic, what we call magnetic anomalies. So you set it to the geographic region's magnetic signature, and it picks up differences. And when you're looking for historic shipwrecks, those differences are oftentimes cannons and anchors. So what we do is when we find anomalies, we mark them with a GPS and we go back and we do what's called an anomaly dive. We're a team of two to four divers with metal detectors and a guideline does ever expanding circle searches to see if we can find what put off the anomaly. Sometimes, a lot of times, we find modern junk and other times we find things that turn out to be really pretty cool. And this one, we, were, we had funding for a four day initial project that the, uh, the, the Columbian Institute of Anthropology and History actually footed the bill for. Uh, and so we turned in our maps and the GPS and, and all of that. And we're gonna go back and do some more anomaly dives because I think we had around 100 anomalies and we were only able to dive on about six in the amount of time we had. The other phase of the project is Cartagena de Indias. This was the most heavily fortified Spanish port. And it was also, uh, one of the more successful Spanish ports and crucial in Spanish trade. As you can see from the picture in the upper left, it's also a very beautiful city to visit. The colonial zone has been wonderfully preserved and, uh, and it just makes a, an awesome place to have uh, a, a research center and have a focus for, some, for research. Uh, and what you can see to the right is a shipwreck that we found during one of our surveys that had over 30 cannons and eight anchors. And so basically what we did in an initial survey was we create a basic site map and then we turn that in and we come back home and we're can, again continuing to do archival research to try and figure out really what, what that wreck site is and what it's from. Is it English? Is it Spanish? There was a lot of activity. Maritime trade was going on. The Spanish galleons, the fleets were leaving from Colombia or from Cartagena. And also there were a number of naval engagements, privateers, Francis Drake sat Cartagena in the late 16th century. Uh, a French privateer attacked Cartagena and in 1741 British Admiral Edward Vernon led the largest uh, naval, British naval engagement with, oh I believe it was almost 300 ships trying to sack Cartagena and he was unsuccessful. Uh, and so what we found in these surveys were a number of shipwrecks, uh, four in the bay and one with a possible second on the, uh, the, the ocean side and again, we're barely scratching the surface um, what was a three-week field project that we just started. So the, we have the colonial Spanish, and we have the colonies, we have their ports, and we have their gold and silver, and we have what they're transporting back to their homeland. Now you can imagine, as, as, with, uh, as I mentioned Francis Drake, this caught the attention of a number of individuals, a number of people in other countries. And one of the most perhaps romanticized aspects of maritime history is that of pirates. Everybody loves pirates for some reason. You, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't love pirates, that's cool. But from 
the early Errol Flynn movies, the black and white swashbuckling movies, to the more modern day theme park rides that I went to as a child, and of course, whatever the latest fad was with four movies that were semi-bearable. Uh, <laughs> and I have not met Johnny Depp yet. Everybody has this fascination with pirates. Uh, and one of the things that we started in Panama was a maritime cultural landscape study. Basically, we're looking at one area and we're trying to understand 500 years of maritime activity in that area around the mouth of the Chagres River. And what stemmed from that was the Lost Ships of Henry Morgan project. Now, the difference, one of the differences, I guess, if there are very many, is with historical archaeology, we have written documents that we can use to either corroborate the archaeological record or be disproven by the archaeological record. Because we all know who writes history, right? It's the winners. The winners always write history. So there are hidden stories that we can find in the archaeological record that otherwise might not be known. So when we think about true history, we can think about what's fiction. So is Henry Morgan like the guy that is depicted here and, and on certain beverages that we don't consume? <laughs> or is he more like this guy in the woodcut who's kind of a portly fellow, not as attractive, he's, he's not buff like the other guy? Okay, so we have to think about, so what's, what's real and what's fake? What's fact and what's fiction? Uh, and so Morgan came into the scene. Again, I'll bring this back up because if you think about economies of scale, you have this little country in brown controlling all of this territory in red. So Spain was overtaxed. The Spain had some serious economic difficulties. Even in the 1580s, King Philip II had an annual salary of 6 million pesos, but his debts totaled over 74 million. Okay, Morgan came on the scene in 1655 when the English attempted to sack Santo Domingo and take over the uh, Hispaniola, which is modern-day Dominican Republic. Henry Morgan cut his teeth as a privateer at the age of 19 and rose to be a, a captain in uh, 1664. Uh, and so he had a number of exploits and expeditions and campaigns against the Spanish. That uh, they solidified his legend. They solidified him as a legitimate privateer. And of course, I have to add a tangent. One man's privateer is another man's pirate. A hero to the English was not necessarily a hero to the Spanish. They viewed him as a modern thief, murderer, pillager, etc. So there's always two sides to the story. So by no means do I mean to romanticize Henry Morgan. But what he did was he used the Chagres River to sail as far inland as he could. He knew the Chagres was there. Uh, and blocking the mouth of the river is this phenomenal Spanish fort called the Castillo de San Lorenzo. And you can see here's the mouth of the Chagres River. The battle for Panama actually occurred there. They had Morgan sent four ships. So this is how big his legend was. Morgan amassed, a crew, uh, Morgan amassed 36 ships and about 1,800 men with almost 250 guns. And we're talking pirates and privateers. And set sail for Panama.